Welcome back to the Q&A and this is part seven. This is actually the last part. I checked out all the comments and I hope I answered them all. I'm sure one or two slipped through even though I just checked all of them this morning. I think all of them have been answered. Some of them I'm gonna answer today. I've answered on the channel in like one sentence or something but I still wanna bring them up just in case someone else is interested in a verbal answer, whatever. But these are the last YouTube questions. I found one on LinkedIn. I found one on Instagram. And uh, that's it. I think these are all. So this is going to be the conclusion to the year ago post of questions. And then I'm going to let it sit for a little bit. And then sometime this year, I'm going to put up another YouTube clip of questions and then we can do this all again. But this time I'm going to answer them faster because it's been a while. And that is, I think, that in terms of context. As always, if you're only listening to these, because I know a couple of people just listen to that and don't watch them, I'm gonna read the questions. They're gonna, you know, be put on the screen, but I'm gonna read them in case you only listen to them. You don't wanna watch anything. I think that is it. As always, I always feel like I'm forgetting things, but um, yeah, and just in case you're new, uh, I do stuff on this channel, including Q and A's and other lectures. You're seeing all these thumbnails blended in. so. Feel free to browse around and check it out. And if you like it, you can always subscribe. And if you don't want to, you don't have to, you can always kind of watch and just kind of let it go. And that is that. Let's get to the questions. Joanne, she's been very patient. She's asking here, I've been in situations where the animators I'm in charge of have delivered subpar work. The deadline to send it to the client was far too short for me to give retakes and get fixes back from the animators in time. So I had to take those shots and fix them myself. And I returned the files afterwards to the animators to handle the future feedback. I know this is largely largely a scheduling problem, but it was unavoidable in my case. Have you been in similar situations where the animators you lead cannot reach the standard needed and there's not much time to let them keep fixing it? How would you handle this? That's a good question, I have to say. And not really. I remember a show which shall not be named and one animator was struggling to get it to get it to work but it wasn't really it wasn't really that the animation was bad per se it was kind of like finding the right tone and the right idea that satisfied everybody up the chain type of thing and i didn't really have a solution except giving him more chance because i was told that the shot would be taken away given to someone else just to kind of get the ball rolling or continue uh, the ball rolling. Um, but then the last take, he actually got it all to work and everybody loved it. Um, so as a general, as a general uh, piece of advice, I would say just communicate frequently to your team in terms of where they're at. Hopefully they are professional enough to understand that that might happen. Your shot either is just not hitting the right mark either in terms of quality or ideas or just the, the creativity within it. Or, you know, sometimes you might get a shot where, like people are better at certain shots. Like you get sometimes cast, sometimes in typecast with certain shots at work. And you might be working on something and then a shot comes in where your talents are just so better suited for the shot. And you might be put on a new shot, but they have to keep going. So your existing shot might be given to someone else. I mean, your shot gets shuffled around for many reasons. Someone goes on vacation and then you inherit someone else's shots. But then that person comes back, then you give them back or you finish them. Or again, something comes up in terms of scheduling and the priorities have changed. I think there are many reasons why an animator will quote unquote lose a shot or just be given another shot. Um, or in this case, like the deadline. The deadline is unavoidable and the quality is not there and someone has to get in. I think the best way to handle this, that's the best way, but my way, the way I would handle this and the way I've been sort of kind of trying to get around, you know, it's a, it's a tricky situation to, to deal with, but you have to just communicate often and let people know where they're at. Um, with my new job, there's definitely a tighter schedule and it's going to be interesting to see how, how the work will look given the shorter schedule where it's kind of more like this. Um, and I think, again, scheduling is just always the overriding factor. It doesn't matter how good you are. It, a certain deadline is always going to feel like there's not enough time. And I think as long as you communicate and remind your team or whatever animator is working with you that this is the reality, this is the bar that we got to hit. And if you're not there, it's not like you're a horrible person because you can't make it, but maybe you're just not quite there yet for that type of shot. Or you are, but again, it needs to be faster. And I, I know it will be easier to put you on something else and continue 
and then you or whoever is in charge can just do the last fixes. I think it's communication, just letting you know that it's nothing personal. That's just, you know, the name of the game, it's just schedules and it's just really tricky. Um, I think that's how I would approach it in terms of, um, you know, a scheduling problem or just anything where shots get taken away. Hopefully there is no random or, you know, like resentment or that type of stuff where everybody on the team understands that's just the reality of the job. I hope that's a good answer, also a late answer, but um, I hope things have gotten better. Um, and actually, I'm curious how you handled it. If you're watching uh, and you and you and this is way past and you had some your tips or whatever you did, I'm curious what, what you did. Cletus here is saying, here is my late question, Jedi. Do I need school, online or traditional, to master animation if there are guys like you here on the internet? <laughs> well, guys like me, don't listen to me. I, again, whatever I say is a very isolated, insulated, very blinder type of thing, uh, perspective and, you know, a list of opinions. Because again, you have to look at who is giving you feedback, right? So if you listen only to my channel, which you shouldn't clearly, is I have been within the VFX world for quite some time. And at the same time, I'm teaching animation that's largely cartoony. But there's always a difference between doing things on a daily basis, uh, the sense of timing that you retain from being in a certain job with a certain style. Just like my, I have a certain worldview and the way I see work and the, the complications of it and what has happened to me, opportunities will be completely different if you listen to someone else who has completely different struggles or his, who's only doing freelance type of work. We have a much better insight in, ter in terms of getting work, retaining work, moving around versus me who's been at a company for one, you know, a, a longer stretch of time. So I didn't have to deal with constant moving and you know what it entails to switch companies, having new contracts, renegotiating stuff. So my thing would be, do you need school online or traditional? I would say what the general BS answer is, whatever helps you the best. I know that's not super helpful. By that, I mean, you will have to decide if this is gonna work for you in terms of the schedule, the financial situation, like how expensive are those schools? Clearly, if you listen to people online, it will be free. So if you can't afford schools, traditional online or whatever, at least make sure you follow a lot of different people. Because the thing is, let's say Animation Mentor, because that's where I teach and that's my perspective. I don't know other schools, but Animation Mentor has a huge amount of mentors from all kinds of lives and, and especially companies. So you're gonna have different opinions and, and you know, piece of advice in terms of style and approach and workflow. And I think that's really cool because you're getting, you're getting such a, a variety of tips and perspectives and uh, like where those tips come from. So you can pick and choose whatever's going to work best for you versus if you just listen to one guy, I know this is a weird thing. No one should do that. And I don't think anybody does, but let's pretend you only listen to one guy on YouTube. That might be not the best way because you're stuck with one opinion. Not like, you know, it's not like you can have massively different opinions in terms of fixing arcs or pops. Like technical stuff is going to be like, that's how you fix it. But then again, the workflow, the speed of it, just the way you approach things with scripts and tools or not, or all that stuff, you really need to look at a lot of different people. And I think schools will hopefully give you that. And if you can't do that and you only check stuff online, make sure you are checking out a lot of people. So like my channel, you can have Sir Wade who has a ton of tips and they're great. Um, Harvey has a ton of tips. Brian, like there are many people out there and these are the 3D and you have also a lot of 2D artists out there. And I would definitely listen to all of them, even if you don't do 2D work, their approach can still help you. Like their ways of dealing with deadlines or, or just kind of the workload, all that stuff. So I would listen to a bunch of people if you can't do that. And as a general, are they better or not? It really comes down to are they better for you? Which means I can't answer that for you. You know, is it something where can you afford the school? Can you afford their schedule? Do you like that the school has live classes or not? Um, are they recorded reviews, but then like a live Q&A once a week, like mentors? So it's it all kind of depends what you prefer. And I hope that answers your question. So kind of a longer answer, but I hope that helps. Hello, sir, JD. Thank you so much for these videos. You're very welcome. This is Jay's. Jay's. Again, I'm going back to kind of pretending to 
pronounce names correctly. It's always kind of tricky. I'm a student wanting to be an animator, but I currently am studying engineering right now. I remember this one because I did answer that in the replies when I answered anyway. Uh, here, didn't get into art school animation majors due to financial reasons. May I ask, how can I come up with my own system to learn animation? I mean, what should I learn first, then next, and so on? Or what should I focus on? Also, is there any way that I'll get to use my future degree as an electronics engineer to get into the animation film industry slash film industry? And I remember my answer was, uh, for instance, like Disney Imagineering. There's a lot of building and stuff. So like an electronics engineer, if you do animation, I mean, the biggest thing will be, for me, it's always kind of like sense of timing and contrast and, po and like appealing poses and body language and acting. Like there's a certain kind of group of things or like, you know, topics you will kind of have to learn and, and get better at. Where engineering might not be very specifically applicable to that. That being said, any job, any life experience outside of animation and film is going to help you. It's a plane. I live next to an airport, like tiny airport. But anyway, when you learn animation, at least this is for me, and I've actually read something just recently where someone recommended this, where it's, you learn animation in school and everything's about animation. You learn those things, you get all those books and you animate all that stuff. And then after a while, you gotta make sure to also live your life where you have hobbies that are completely not related to animation. Like the more you can pull experiences from life, I think the more creative your shots are gonna be and the more honest with you know the performance and things that people can relate to because it's not you looking at other animation movies or tv shows and then pulling that as your experience quote unquote and inspiration because that that was already filtered through another animator or a creative so you're getting kind of like a rehash of a rehash of a rehash of a rehash so i would try to find hobbies and 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 like you know like a side job whatever you have that gives you other type of experiences that can then shape your creative ideas for your animation, if that makes sense. So engineering could still help you, maybe in whatever ways. Um, in terms of, you didn't get into art school because of financial reasons, how can you not be your own system or animation? Um, so in the previous um, Q&A, someone asked about, you know, exercises you can start, so the 51 tips, uh, 51 exercises you can do. Again, I'll link it in the description. But I think if you just start on your own, and you can't, and you're completely from a different background, different you know major or different experience, different job, and you're starting fresh. My main advice is always do not skip the basics. You might be doing engineering or something completely else. You might be a lawyer, whatever, or you might be in working constructions, or you might be a chef. Like I don't know. I had someone that was doing um, like robotics, prosthetics, and stuff like that. Like sometimes you have people that switch majors. Like oh my god, your job is amazing. Why would you do animation now? But they might look at, yeah, but I really want to do movies and I love, you know, Disney movies, Pixar movies, Sony movies, like you know, TV stuff. And I love the performance, it's great. So their eye is on the end of this is an acting performance or just a character performance. And a lot of students like to just skip somewhat the basics or at least rush through them because the lip sync acting performance is what they really want to do. And sure, and it's also awesome, but, and it's not and, it's a but. But you can't skip the basics. You have to go through the bouncing balls, the bouncing balls with the tail, the bouncing balls that are squash and stretch to be a character, and then a pendulum, objects animation, and then just maybe a ball with two legs, and a sit down, a sit up, a jump. You have to go through these, and not just once. Don't just do a bouncing ball once and that's it. Because if you skip the basics or you just kind of rush them, it can only hurt you down the line. Because you have to concentrate on more than just body mechanics, like the basics in body mechanics have to be super solid. That way you can only concentrate on performance and ideas and just kind of you know, the character stuff. But if if you're trying to make a performance work, but the performance doesn't read at all because your mechanics are horrible, it's because you skipped them, you didn't practice enough. And just, again, it's only gonna hurt you. So in your journey, just to kind of roundabout answer this question, if you're on your own, and you can't afford school, you're just going through, I'm gonna go through step by step, you know, the list of things. Do not skip the basics, do not rush. You're better off really hammering down on those bouncing balls. Just the, the, the sense of weight and the timing, everything at the end is a bouncing ball. There's so many things that I've animated where you can kind of just constrain a sphere to this and just hide the rest and kind of figure out the rhythm and timing through bouncing balls. It will always help you. So for anybody watching this, do not skip the basics. I can't. I can't even count how many times I've said this in my classes, where someone 
They, they have, you know, in previous classes, they've gone through the exercises. And then in this new class, it's acting pieces and then they show me they're real. It's not quite there. And I subjectively recommend to go back to body mechanics and kind of wait with the lip sync and say, no, I want to do it now. And then do the lip sync and it just doesn't work. Just because the mechanics are just not there whatsoever in terms of timing and weight and all that stuff. So do not skip the basics. Eric's here, uh, not Eric's, but Eric here is saying, uh, I'm writing this when I watch so questions. I'm going to skip the comments uh, here. <laughs> what was your reacting or reaction when you know they will do a new Star Wars trilogy, episode seven, eight, nine? And if you can answer, when did you know about it? Okay. That's a good question. When did I know about this? Well, my main reaction was excitement because it's been a while because I worked on episode three. That was my first job at ILM. So that was 17 and a half years ago. And there was already the, the original trilogy, which is, that's my, I'm, I'm born in the 70s. Uh, so the original trilogy, non-special edition, that's my, that's my Star Wars. We're like, oh, that's my childhood. And everything is about, for me, it's, it's it, the original trilogy, non-special edition. And then they, you know, obviously stopped and you grew up as a fan and play with toys and all that stuff. And then a special edition came out. It was awesome. Some cool new stuff. And then long break and then the prequels. And then I worked on episode three and then a long stretch of nothing. And I'm saying all this because when then the announcement was made about episode seven, and I think it must have been when Disney bought Lucasfilm and then I think they right away announced and we're going to continue with new Star Wars. I mean, I think that must have been when I heard about it. Uh, and it was really cool because I liked the movies that JJ did and like it's it's a different approach. And it was just, you know, like someone taking the franchise into a new direction, which this has been now a couple of years and it has gone in a new direction. And some people have liked it, some people have not. And there's more stuff going on. And we got the Mandalorian, which is awesome. Also, Boba Fett is going to be awesome. So I was excited and I'm still excited. And as with everything, some things you like more than others. Some people don't like them at all. Some people love them all. Um, that's kind of my, my general um, answer. And now that I left ILM, actually, this is the first time I will have no idea about anything. Because <laughs> usually when movies come out, we have access to kind of behind the scenes. You can see the footage, the rough cuts, um, set photos and stuff like that, where you know they take pictures of all the props and character turnarounds and costumes. And I would... Usually on movies, I don't want to really spoil too much. I want to know what I'm working on, the sequence. But there's some movies where I just go and try to find everything that they filmed and that they took photos of. And that's usually Star Trek and Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And uh, now that I left, I will know nothing. I do know nothing um, about Obi-Wan, for instance. I know enough-ish about Boba Fett, knowing that it's going to be really cool. But then uh, Obi-Wan or anything after that, I have no idea. So it's actually going to be really cool seeing all this with zero knowledge, zero spoilers. I'm very pumped. That's kind of my very long, weird, rambly, tangently answer to this. Michael here saying, have you ever used mocap? Yes. And can you do just one video on working with mocap accents in Maya? All right. Yeah. Yes. I picked this one out just because the quick answer is yes. At ILM, we use mocap. Um, I've been in the suit. Um, I've directed mocap for one movie. I think direct as in like... You have really patient people that get into the suits and you just tell them what to do for the sequence that you're leading or animating on. But it's overall a lot of fun. You get the props and you run around. It's really cool. So yes, I have worked with mocap, um, but I'm not going to do an Xsense clip because I do not have Xsense. But what I started was a series with Rococo and there are more coming. I have about eight or nine total and uh, I did two. And I got super busy. Stuff happens. Yeah, as if you watch my channel, I'm always really busy. But um, there, this also comes with a deadline. So I actually have a firm deadline by when I have to finish and upload all my, my other Rococo clips. So there's a lot coming, which is going to be recording and actually editing and then editing either in the Rococo software in Maya as well. Um, different approaches for taking um, the mocap data, making it cartoony. I want to do a stress test in terms of, um, because they're they're inertia-based um, suits. They're not markers with cameras. So when you jump, it could be tricky. If you walk upstairs, it can be tricky. I want to do like a distance test. I want to make it on, um, there's many things I want to do. Like, and, and actually I got, they were there. I got the gloves as well. They sent me the gloves. Thank you so much, Coco. And I want to review those. So I have a bunch of stuff I want to do. And I've also been approached by another company, not Xsense, about another suit. 
but I can't do multiple suits at the same time due to contract stuff. So I'm going to finish Rococo. It should be on in a couple months. And then maybe the other suit company will contact me. Um, I I think I emailed Xsense a while back and I never heard back. They're really expensive suits. So I'm not sure if I'm the right person. I'm like some some nobody on YouTube. Like, hey, send me this, yeah, I don't know, $10,000, $15,000 suit. Probably not going to happen. I would love down the line to have tested and compared all suits, all suits, whatever, like, you know, a good amount of suits just for myself, it would be really cool to know the quality for people obviously watching, for companies that, you know, want to, you know, retest and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, I would love to have that in the future, like a really nice long selection of, I looked at this, this, and this suit. These are the, you know, the differences, especially because of price. There's a huge price difference between Rococo and, uh, and Xsense and some other ones. Anyway, hope that makes sense. Toothless here is asking, Okay, I have some questions regarding work visa degree colleges, slash, slash, meaning slash, visa, slash, degree, slash, colleges. One, is online degree accepted in the work visa, um, such as Full Sail or the Los Angeles film? And I remember uh, answering there, and it's the same answer. I don't know, to be honest. And I haven't done research since that question here. I think no. I think for a work visa, I think it has to be at least an accredited school that has a bachelor, like an actual degree. I could be wrong, things change all the time. Currently, I'm not sure. Anybody watching this, and I know a lot of people have a lot more information about this than me. Uh, I would love to know your answer as well. Um, I should have Googled. Actually, it's, it's horrible for me to bring this up and not have Googled. But from what I've been hearing recently and lately, no. But again, I'm not a specialist. I will check with um, the visa recommendations in your country and, and, and um, contact the schools, to be honest, directly to see if they can help you. Two, and if yes, then which school is the best? Again, I don't know. Um, and especially online schools, I only have experience with Animation Mentor, which I love. So my recommendation is always going to be towards that school. But then again, you look at the showreels of other schools, they're doing fantastic work. I think it really, again, comes down to what works best for you. If, let's say, the online school helps you with your work visa, and that's the first question is a yes, then again, for you is, what type of school is going to be the best for you? Like Mentor does, we do recorded reviews, but then once a week we have one live Q&A for an hour. Other schools have live classes and then that's it. And maybe, you know, like with, with reviews, you can schedule the a certain amount of time for each student, kind of the same amount of time. So everybody gets the same feedback, like the length of it. So it's kind of like a fair, um, you know, attribution of, of time and you, know, you don't feel neglected versus a real-time classroom has potentially, you, you might spend half an hour suddenly with a student and then you run out of time. So this was actually a work cut. I wasn't I wasn't running out of time to record. I actually ran out of a memory card. <laughs> this is stupid. Q and A's are cursed. And I didn't put up the mic as like a backup mic. So I don't know yet if part one um, recorded fine. I'm gonna pretend it is. This is my backup mic for part two. And uh, I got time now and uh, the recording has reset. Anyway, I was in the middle of explaining how, again, you know, so you have an online school that has live classes. So you might run off time for students, but the positive is, or the, the pro is that it's a live class. So you have immediate feedback versus if you record feedback, there's no feedback from students. Like you just, they just have to watch. And if they have questions, they can't interactively ask the teacher. So there are pros and cons for both. So you have to decide if an online class with live class is better for you or an online class with recorded re um, reviews, but one live Q&A is better for you. Again, it's all very subjective. Hope that makes sense. Um, three, I know that degree is necessary for obtaining a work permit, but the problem is that I want to study at Animation Mentor, but I can only choose one degree or AM because of the financial conditions. So which do you suggest? What do you suggest? Uh, again, um, it all depends. It all goes back to my same answer. It really all depends what's better for you. I'm a big fan of Animation Mentor um, and looking at other schools, their show reels are great. Like Adam School and Adam Squad, they have fantastic work. Um, so it also kind of depends on maybe the style. Like some schools are maybe a bit more cartoony. Some will have a bit more uh, variety in terms of styles, like whatever works best for you. It really is all very subjective in terms of how you're going to approach this and what, what works best for you. Then, no switch here. Jack is asking here, I have a very simple question. What makes a happy animator? <laughs> right, and I'm, I'm posting here all the answers here. Um, and again, the answer was 
It's a very complex question depending on the individual. There's no one answer. But then, you know, we go back and forth and then so basically what makes you, me a happy uh, animator, right? So, good question. What makes me a happy animator? What makes me happy? It's like a wish list of things and then a reality things of things. It's like having enough time for the shop. <laughs> I think Eunice, previous Q&A I talked about deadlines. Uh, you will never have enough time for your shots. I think being able to go through the whole process of idea finding and creativity and then blocking out, but then also having time to polish until you really feel it's done. It's kind of rare, can happen, but it's tricky. Um, that would be one thing. I'm waiting for my dog, by the way. It's 7 a.m. ish. Everybody's waking up now. I'm just waiting for my dog to come in. Um, that makes me happy. <sighs> There's so many things. The thing is, I just like animating. To be honest, like every time I sit down and I animate, it makes me happy. Sure, sometimes you get a lot of revisions, revisions to do and you might not be pumped about, really, I got to do like this version 10 times. But again, to me, it's like, all right, well, and then I can just practice again. It's, it's going to make me back. The initial reaction is always going to be, really? Another take? But then you go, all right, well, then let's, let's try that. And then ultimately it ends up being better because you tried a new thing. Every time it kind of Back, like I think about really, did I really have to do 20 versions of this? But then you go back and look at the versions, you go, wow, this last one is actually really better than what was before. Because sometimes you're kind of stuck in that world of I'm animating and I think it's great and that's all I'm seeing. And then once you step back and you look back at it, you know, even like a week later, realize that's too fast. That's not good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, I just like the process. I like animating in general. So what makes me happy is getting the turnovers, getting to know what I'm about to animate, um, and then seeing the, the actual final result. Like when you're done animating, sure, you could be happy with your shot, but there's a difference between the play blast and then the final render. Like I love seeing uh, the final render stuff with the comp and effects and like the whole thing with sound and music. That stuff makes me happy. Um, I love discovering things. I've just recently watched Centaur World, which is just so good. I just finished He-Man. Uh, we're always watching Blue, uh, Bluey. Um, so like seeing other people create something that is unexpected or that I, that just really makes me giggle or like, whoa, that makes me happy as an animator. Right now I'm finishing up Primal. I'm finally watching the show and it's so good. Primal is so good. Centaur World just makes me laugh so hard. Love the music. That stuff makes me happy as an animator, just kind of discovering um, new shows or movies. Um, next week, uh, Star Trek Lower Decks season two starts. I can't wait for that. I'm a huge fan of Star Trek and that an animated form and it's really funny. That stuff just makes me happy. Um, teaching makes me really happy as an animator because I like helping other people and I like seeing that it actually helps other people because you might say stuff it might have zero impact on a student that they're not helped at all. But when you see them when you see that it clicks with the students and then you see the next update and the, sh and the work is awesome, that's super cool. I love seeing when students get to the companies they want to get to, when they post, hey, I got accepted at this company. It's like, yes, they made it. Because you kind of, after a couple of weeks, you kind of get to know them, you know their dreams and their hopes, and it's cool to see them succeed. Um, I don't know, there's so many things. It's like silly stuff as an animator. Like it's almost like the excuse as an animator that you can you can put props and things at your desk. Like I have all kind of Smaller things here that I can uh, pick up. I mean, this is small. That's why I'm picking it up. I can't pick up my bigger stuff here. But like, I love that as an animator to have things everywhere that I can look at that either inspire me or remind me of things or just kind of, what is that kind of, there you go, <laughs> badgy. Uh, yeah, that stuff. Um, I don't know. So many things. So many things. It's, it's, a, it's a wide topic of, not as tricky with, with being home, like, I love being home as an animator. I love being home that I can animate and also see my family a lot more than before. But at the same time, I miss my coworkers. So that's the drawback. What made me happy as an animator was to go to an office and get to see them, you know, the friends again. Like, hey, what did you watch? Yes, what did you do? And then, hey, what about this shot? Sitting in dailies together and laughing at shots and like that type of environment uh, makes me happy as an animator. Now with lockdown, yeah, it's a bit different. Or not lockdown, but you know, we are kind of working from home. Um, that has kind of changed. But now, actually, I switched jobs. So this is this is the end, like Friday. It's my first week at Warner Brothers. And getting to see the material, uh, the character designs, the ideas that they have, the, the ambitions for the show, meeting a bunch of new people 
uh, a new team, uh, having new responsibilities or, or bigger responsibilities or more responsibilities or just, or a different type of work. Like what I'm gonna do is gonna be fairly more ex expanded compared to what I did before in terms of overseeing things and having input. And, and that makes me really um, happy as an animator is learning, learning something new, having new challenges and just constantly pushing yourself to expand your skill set, your horizons, your resume, like pragmatic things and just kind of like creative stuff. All that stuff makes me happy as a as an animator. Watching movies makes me happy as an animator because as you know, if you're watching them or if you're not, my acting analysis and tips for animators on Thursdays, um, uh, I would highly recommend that you watch those. Actually, I got my new job because of that series. So plug. And that makes me happy watching movies and taking notes because I, I get to kind of learn more about the show or the movie and kind of apply that to my own work or help out with someone else with those ideas or just kind of understanding the creative aspect and the construction of a movie or a TV show. I just like, I just like behind the scenes of movies and how they're made from costumes to makeup to prosthetics to sound. Like I like, I like all that stuff. And what I love as an animator and what makes me happy as an animator is that that is my world. My world is movies. And I've watched movies since uh, since I'm a kid. I think I mentioned that before somewhere in a clip checking my my SD card in my time now. But my earliest memory as a baby was literally the, um, what's that called? And I'm of course forgetting the word, the crib where you have the bars. I literally remember seeing the bars and looking over and seeing this wall of VHS tapes with Monchi Chi, these little monkeys that I had as a kid, they were there. Uh, I think of like a dark one and the brown one or a, a brown and a white one. I can't remember the monkeys, little monkeys, you can put the thumb in the mouth. But they were there on the shelf of all the VHS tapes. My dad used to collect moods. He would have a wide range of movies and documentaries and stuff like that. So since I'm a kid, I've been watching Hitchcock movies and documentaries and like Westerns, all classic stuff. And then going into, um, you know, obviously with my childhood, all the ILM movies like Star Wars and Ghostbusters and Goonies and um, but like such a, a wide variety of movies that I just, I guess I fell into it and I always loved it. So my whole upbringing was movies and music. My dad is, he's a retired doctor. He used to be a surgeon, but he always played, um, saxophone. I think I mentioned that before. Anyway, it's boring for anybody watching this, but he used to play tenor saxophone. He, like, he has a little old jazz band. So he would always practice a lot of jazz at home. So for me, it was always like classical music and jazz because of my dad and movies. And then with my own interest and then like a lot of hip hop as a you know, high school and you know, eighties and nineties and then scores. And then, you know, like the, all, all kinds of music, house music and electronic music and all kinds of stuff. Like that to me is just the world of, it's almost like rhythm and, and performance in a way is, is my upbringing in a way. That's not super pretentious, but that I mean, I've always heard music and I've always watched movies and that's just always where my interests have been. And what makes me happy as an animator is that that is now my world as a professional. That's my job. I get paid to do something that's within the world that I love. And I think that is a very long answer <laughs> to your question, but it just, it just makes me, it, it makes me pumped. It makes me pumped that I'm able to be in this world. Like right now with the new job, I am collecting a list of movies that I need to watch to, to create kind of like a reference library and also kind of like a, a style library. Again, I can't talk anything. It's new job, new NDAs and confidential stuff. But what I can say is since it's Wings of Fire, it's dragons, right? So I'm going to go through everything you can imagine when it comes to dragons. Every movie, their styles, so we can all come together into like a, a style that we will reference for the show. And I'm really pumped. That's my homework. My homework is going through a bunch of movies and ripping things, studying them, analyze them, taking notes. Like this is super cool. And that's, I'm getting paid for this. This is insane. Like that aspect of my life is still insanity to me <laughs> that I can, that this is homework and that's my job. I can now go through all the classics of movies and the new ones and just everything and collect this and, and that's homework. Like it blows my mind and just being like, what makes you happy as an animator? Being an animator makes me happy. Everything that comes with this job makes me happy. Yes, of course. And if you watch my other clips, like industry advice or this industry sucks and I like clickbaity titles, but yes, within industry, clearly there are many problems. There's a bunch of stuff happening right now. Tangent just closed, 400 people laid off. With every industry and every job, there are massive problems. There are concerns, there's 
their harassment, their stuff that's not, you know, it's just, there's so much that's not good, obviously, in, in every field. But at the same time, it's also awesome, right? So this is my, it's not like, if you're new, if you're watching this as a student, or you are brand new to animation, you're trying to get into this, just know that animation is not what the making of are, where everybody's always happy, where you have your own cubicle with things or the companies, you know, like ILM, we have, we have Urkel breaks, we have paid overtime dinners and lunches. Sometimes we get massage, we get, um, you know, our Urkel desk specially made for us. And we have screenings at work. We have directors coming for Q and A's. There are many, many perks at those companies. Obviously they're great. At the same time, that's not all there is to the company, right? So if you only watch making of of companies and, and you know, they're produced to make it look great, that's not the actual industry, right? Just kind of throw that out there. So if you're new to this industry and you want to break into this industry or you just kind of want to learn how, how can I be an animator, just know that my excitement for this is not the only thing that there is about animation. You're going to have to deal with a bunch of other stuff that's not exciting, that can be problematic, that can be difficult, that can be stressful. Animation is really hard to get into it, to stay in, especially when you're contract based and you got to go from company to company, you move around cities or countries. It's tricky when you have families and kids. It's just, there's a bunch of stuff that comes with this job that's really not easy. As easy as it may look in the making of, or everybody looks happy, there's a bunch of stress that comes with it. Just kind of throwing it out there. But as a whole, I love it. And again, it's very subjective, but that's my point of view based on my experience of what I've gone through. But I love it. And that makes me, that whole being in this job just makes me happy as an animator. Anyway, that has massive tangents and weird corners of replies. But anyway, that's my answer to your, to your simple question. He says, you have a very simple question. And I guess I, I had a very complex rambly answer. You have a big bookcase full of books. <laughs> Any books you can recommend, perhaps some about animation. Yes, I answered that in the reply, but I'm gonna say it here. I have a playlist about animation books. So these are books that I like a lot, that I review. Um, and what I'm gonna continue, there's more coming. I'm gonna continue with my reviews on Wednesdays. And hopefully by then, when I have a bunch of them, I'll probably do like another playlist of, these are the specific books that I recommend, let's say if you wanna learn animation. So it's not just like art of books, but if you want to go through the process of learning animation with extra help, not just from classes or whatever, then I would recommend these books. And I have a bunch of, of them um, that I haven't reviewed yet. So that will be something I've stuck, something stuck in my teeth. Um, I have that coming in the future. Hold on, I've got double questions here. Okay. I was wondering if it's worth it to switch from IK to FK in walk cycles for student reels for those nice arcs or just keep it simple with IK all the way. I did answer that as well in the reply there, but saying it again, uh, FK just gives you free arcs, especially in walk cycles. I think, you know, you're gonna have those arcs, out, those outer arcs and figure eights and all that stuff. Um, arcs and FK, just that's just a happy combination. I do a lot in IK and arcs are a pain. Uh, they're workarounds. Um, but if you're just doing something like a walk cycle, it's not that long, right? You might as well go with uh, with FK. That being said, because the walk cycle is short, you can go frame by frame with IK. Um, I just like IK because it's fast to pose out, but for some things it's a huge pain. So I think it's one of those where it's quick answer. I would probably recommend FK. And at the same time, it all depends on your workflow, what's better for you. The second answer would be try both. <laughs> if you have too much time, just try both. With all kinds of workflows, you got to try different things so you can see what works better for you. That's my answer. Uh, Cartoon Cafe is asking, hi, sir. Now I'm doing my training as a 3D animator. I'm using Autodesk Maya. I want to know about the role of Blender and Maya in future animation industry, which will take place in future. Will Maya become outdated? That is a question I cannot answer, but I, I added it here anyway, just because Blender comes up every now and then. Um, and I would love to know Blender. Again, I only opened it once and then they ran out of time and it was so different and, and it's uh, so much new to learn. So much, you know, different different workflows and aspects, but I do want to know it. I will eventually get back into it. And my goal is that I will know Blender and Maya like the same amount. Like I don't know Maya well, besides animation. And it's going to be the same thing with Blender. Like it's a bunch of I will never know. But I want to know how to animate well in Blender. That is absolutely a goal and I'm going to get there. But that's not like, eh, I really want to take the time and, and do it. 
the role of both. I don't know. The cool thing about Blender right now is that it's free. So if you want to learn something from scratch and you can't afford Maya, there you go. Maya has now the indie version and they're, you know, obviously if you're a student, you get Maya for free, you get the student license. There are ways around things. Again, it all kind of depends on what you if what you need and what your needs are. And if you are not, not in the school and you can't afford Maya in any other way, then Blender might be your way to go. I don't see Blender going away because it's doing really awesome stuff. Um, so yeah, I can't really answer it, but I would definitely look at both. And then you're gonna have to make a decision in terms of what works best for you. It's a very non-answer, isn't it? All right, that's it for YouTube. Now it's, uh, that looks like a LinkedIn question. Hi, Jean-Denis, this is from Jean-Michel. Jean Michael, Jean Mitchell, I don't know, Jean-Michel. Hi, Jean-Denis, thanks for this Q&A time. You're very welcome. I have questions regarding schools. Why animation schools are so expensive, even for online ones? How someone who really cannot pay those tuitions can correctly learn animation? Do you know any effective solution to get financial help to join schools like Animation Mentor and Adam Squad? I'm gonna go backwards with this. So financial help, I don't know. Again, it really depends on the different schools. I would look at the school website. They probably have, very likely have, information about that. And then how that relates to you, your country, and your means. Like that's something um, you have to kind of depend. You have to look at which school financial help is going to work best for you. Um, how can someone how, uh, who really cannot pay? Uh, how can you learn animation without being able to pay for it? Well, again, this goes back to previous stuff. There are free things, right? Just check out Sir Wade's channel. Check out my channel. Check out Brian Harvey, like many other people. So there's there is there are many free resources out there where technically you could build up a whole curriculum in terms of learning. What's missing is the feedback um, because you can only learn so much without having actual critiques and feedback with, you know, pointing out what is wrong or what would be better. And it's just, it's just good to have feedback. I mean, eventually you're going to have to show something to someone. And if you can, if you can't afford that, try to just post them on LinkedIn that you did here on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, and then say, Hey, uh, I would love to get feedback for this. And I'm sure someone will be out there um, that will help you. Or you can also get my workshops. This is very selfish uh, in terms of a plug here. But I know that my workshop is really cheap compared to others. If you look at other, that's very arrogant to say, but I'm going to say it. Uh, I price my workshop low for a reason so that people can afford it. And whenever I see other workshops pop up from other people, they're fairly expensive. They're priced much higher. It's like, okay, <laughs> I mean, good for you if you want to make that money. But you know, the point is that I want to do these so I can help other people who cannot afford, like the, like you said, those schools. So there I say, um, usually the time is shorter. A lot of workshops have like 10 to 12 weeks. I technically have 16. It's not really weeks. You can, su you can submit weekly or whatever. But if you go weekly, I do 16 for 499. And uh, I'm, the, I'm sure there's someone out that's cheaper than that. But most of them are not. So that's going to be my my switch to being arrogant and and a critique um about other people <laughs> price things more affordably that's english um you might say yeah but you know there there are other companies and and they have so much more experience or they can do this like yeah but then at the same time why are you doing this are you just writing the name of the company and your experience again i'm not here if you provide a service you should get paid for it like i'm the first one to say that i'm not going to do things for free I post my critiques for free on YouTube, but there's no feedback. You can only listen to this. So I still want to do things for people that can't afford stuff. So that will be free. And I'm going to keep uploading the feedback for free, but I'm not going to do 16 weeks of feedback for free because it takes time. And as much as I want to help, it's an exchange of service. And I'm again, the first one to say, you got to get paid for that. It's a job and I'm helping out and you're going to get paid for this. That's just how it goes. At the same time, you can still, since it's your own stuff, you can decide how expensive things can be. And then it becomes the question, do you really want to help or are you using your cachet to kind of cash in more? A little critique on the industry as a whole, leaving it at that. Now, why are they so expensive? It's because it's run by a, a lot of people. You got all the mentors you got to pay. You have the people running the sites, you got IT, you got people designing those things. You got people do the marketing and the PR, people who are payroll, hiring, HR, like there are so many companies or so many people involved with running those companies and they need to be compensated fairly. Again, it's an exchange of services. They need to get paid. So it's just going to be expensive. And if you have a brick and mortar school 
well, then you got to pay for rent. Or if you bought something, I mean, just you have the physical aspects of electricity, whatever is in there, like furniture, all that stuff, IT, computers. That is a lot of money. And that's why it costs a lot of money. Now, there's a whole other discussion about, yeah, well, it could be helped out maybe by the government or funds or something and education should be lower and, you know, maybe schools shouldn't be for profit. And that is a whole other discussion, which I also have not enough experience. So I'm not even going to pretend to have an opinion on this. It's just some schools are just really expensive where you think they could be cheaper. Um, yeah, this, it's, it's a massively uh, long answer that, it, uh, to be honest, I can't really give because I'm not experienced enough in that aspect. I just know as being a mentor and being surrounded by all those people, it's just a lot of people involved that want to do the best they can and you got to pay those people. So the price will obviously go right up there. So I think kind of that's that. Courtney is asking here, one animation workflow tip you wish you knew as a new animator that you either figured out or learned once you hit the industry. Ooh, I forgot that question and I didn't really prepare an answer. What time is it? Okay, I got some time. It's seven minutes before it ends. Um, that's a good question. A workflow tip that I wish. Whew, that's a good question. You know, I think Courtney's going to go, really? It's been a year. It says here a year and you're still not answering this question. I, I'm wondering if I should not rush this. And most questions I can just answer was I know it. But this one, I wonder if I should just do a, a separate clip. That's such a cop out. One thing that I learned, how about this? If I look back and what is the best thing throughout all those years that I feel like has helped me, and it's not a practical tip, I think I would say is letting go of my attachment to the shop. I think that would be the one. You can bring things up like, Work, you know, shooting reference and, and and using that reference and how you use it to for your animation, blocking things out, stuff like that. There are many little workflow tips like this. But to be honest, that overriding tip is if I'm attached to my work too much and I get notes that change that direction of the work and I hang on to what I did, I will be slower in my workflow and I will be looked at as difficult to work with in terms of not not following notes like that's a big thing within teams if you work with someone and you give them notes they don't follow them that's a pain in the butt if you give them notes and they complain about the notes for 10 minutes or they only do half of this or they kind of like to have an attitude about it that's a huge pain to deal with and it's just like you don't want someone like that on your team and to me it's almost like that's an overriding thing over technical workflow tips if that makes sense I feel like once I accepted and embraced the fact that if I do this shot, I'm going to have a lot of fun doing it. But once I submit it, it's out of my hands. And then you just have to accept whatever feedback comes in because you are doing the shot for someone else. It's not my own shot that I'm doing at home here for my own reel. And I think the moment your mind clicks into that perspective and that attitude where you can go, all right, I can do 10 versions. It's going to be awesome. You want this? All right, let me do 10 versions of this. Not that you should always do 10 versions. I'm saying that you can always attack the shot with enthusiasm, not worrying about what happens to the shot later on. I think when I made that switch, I, I feel like it freed me up to just have more fun with it and not worry too much and also not react as much in dailies or generally when you get notes, you're like, oh man, I thought this was really cool, but now I, personally, I feel it's less cool. That only hinders my progress as an animator with the shot the, the dynamics with the team. So I think that would be my tip. I don't know if it's a workflow tip, but I know it affects my workflow a lot. So that would be my answer. I still want to think about this more and maybe to make this into one clip specifically about this is the thing to look out for when you start at a company or start your animation journey. Um, let me think about that. But I hope this was an answer as well. I still got three minutes, maybe. Uh, and this is the last question. Seabass the ROM. Okay. Thanks, JD. I really appreciate all your effort in helping animators. You're very welcome. I know that our reels have to stand out there as there's a lot of applicants. I got a suggestion from a teacher of mine that I begin my reel with a short 2D animated attention grabber, follow with my name and info. I think my animation's okay, but is it odd to begin it this way? 
Will it cause confusion to recruiters watching? Like, it not this a 3D animation reel? I can imagine them skipping ahead to check and not returning back. Maybe I'm overthinking. Uh, yeah, to be honest, I, I feel like if you're presenting, let's put it this way. Always think in terms of your reel as, what is the worst case scenario of someone watching your reel? They don't have time. They don't have headphones. They don't, they don't hear the sound. And they don't have time. So you got to grab them quickly and convince them quickly you can do this. So it's a 3D reel and it starts with 2D and it's maybe even a bit too long. People are like, what is this? That's weird. Off. Worst case scenario. I'm not saying this happens, uh, but it could. So I would say, I would say stick to 3D. Just do your name quickly, not too long, maybe three seconds and get straight to the reel. And maybe at the end, you can finish it with the 2D piece. Like, and I can also do that. It wouldn't be cute to show you this, but I would say go straight to your work, especially if you want to get a job. Maybe just creating a reel as in like, I don't need a job. I'm just creating a reel just to show off what I did. It's awesome and I'm excited about this. Then you can just do whatever you want to do and then okay. But I think if you're going to go for a job and it's very like, oh, I'm going to get this and convince people quickly, I personally wouldn't do it. But again, subjectively, but since you're asking me, that's my subjective opinion. And that is the last question. I only have a minute left. So thank you for watching. I'm going to let this be now in a couple months or maybe weeks. I don't know. I'm going to do a new one where you can uh, submit all your questions. Uh, it's going to be a very long clip. Again, these are two things of half an hour somewhat. It's about to close. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet and you like what you saw and you want to not miss things, subscribe. I got workshops. I'm I'm a human. So you like everything at once uh, in the, at the same time. That's it. Thank you for watching. These are always a blast to uh, to answer. Uh, and thank you for watching and posting questions. It's really so much fun. I love this. And I hope it wasn't too rambly. I, will, I hope it was helpful. And uh, I'm going to ramble till it turns off. We're just going to turn in 10 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, watch other clips if you want to. I know it's like a weird ramble. I don't know how to end. I feel like I'm under the gun. So thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. And this is a really long clip. So if you're not watching, thank you for listening. And uh, I will see you in my next clip. It's going to continue on Monday as always. And that's it. Thank you and see you or have you listened to me in my next upload. Thanks.